As the sport of bowling continued to grow, left-handers became a dominant force. They had a more equal lane condition to bowl on in the 1960s and 70s. Two reasons, one, the polyurethane lane surface, and number two, precision oiling equipment that put down a uniform oiling pattern on the lanes. One of the dominant players of this era was Johnny Petraglia. Johnny won the Triple Crown. He won the 71 Firestone Tournament Champions, the 77 U.S. Open, and in 1980, he won the PBA National Championship. If he strikes here and gets nine and a spare, he would shut out Gary Dickinson. He's down on the deck, pounding up jubilation, not frustration. That's a game of bowling can often uh, force you into. And John knows about the importance of that shot. Situation becomes this, nine spare, he shuts out Dickinson. Strike, he shuts out Dickinson. If Petraglia would happen to get eight and a spare, we have a possibility once again of a tie. both over his head and Gary Dickinson what a day yeah well one three came from position number five but he's against that tiger who shoots it down now what a shot four in a row Fenny it's a 235 and you have a triple crown winner another famous left-hander Earl Anthony dominant in the 70s and 80s like Don Carter was Bowler of the Year six times. Was the first bowler to earn $1 million in prize money. Doing it in 1982 with his victory in Toledo at the PBA National Championship. Chris, with a strike here, Earl Anthony can go into the $1 million bracket. If he doesn't strike, Charlie Tapp can still win the National Championship. In fact, he'd be 12,586 beyond. Earl has struggled on this lane. He needs a strike to win. Look at his reaction. You will seldom see that, but in this historical achievement for Earl Anthony at Imperial Lanes in the National Championship, wow. He's the winner. He's going to be in the 220s, even with a bad count. Look at that. He is over the million-dollar mark. 43 years old, his 38th work victory, his fifth national championship. What a competitor. <laughs> Earl in the 230s going against Charlie Tapp. And you were here at the richest tournament ever, the Richards share to the winner of 38,000, but more important, he has set a pace as Susie Gives him that ever loving hug. In Earl's career, he bowled many 300 games, but not one on television. The next 300 game on a live telecast professional bowlers tour was by Jim Stefanich in 1974. He needs three. two perfect games on national TV before. Jack Villandolillo in Houston, Texas, Texas of Houston, Texas. That was in Akron, the 1967 Tournament of Champions, and Johnny Gunther in San Jose in 1969. Maybe we're going to look at the third. and a new Cougar automobile, all on a strike right here. And the first show of the year. This is it for $10,000.
Jim Stefanich was a very serious player, but as time went on in the PBT, some of the players took on a flair of showmanship and flamboyance. Ernie Schlegel didn't let his flamboyant uniforms distract him while winning five PBA titles in the 1980s. Guppy Troop can be spotted by his pants, but there's nothing fishy about Guppy, as his eight PBA championships will show. Marshall Holman's color comes from his heart. Holman let all his feelings show as he battled for a second U.S. Open title in 1985. Oh, is he happy to win? A man known to show his emotions, whatever they are, from Jacksonville, Oregon. And is this a happy man? Nelson, all the matches we've covered on television, we see examples of pressure, the mental aspect of the game. Let's go to 1987, the first frame of Pete McCordick's 300 game, and examine it. Oh, that looked to me like any other McCordick strike. Well, I remember that day, Chris, 1987. Pete McCordick had been bowling very well in 1986. He came out in 87 in top shape, and he warmed up real well that day. He was playing a shot very confidently, and when we came on television, he threw that first frame like it was just as easy as could be, no pressure. Now let's watch pressure as we continue our examination of Pete McCordick. He has strung together nine in a row. He's up and shooting in the 10th frame. Nine in a row, needs three more. Now he needs two and $100,000. Pete McCordick, a great arm swing. He loses the ball slightly on the downswing. You see a ball only about three or four inches over the foul line, but direction is 95% of the sport, solid in the pocket. The last player to stand in this position I can remember, Chris, was Johnny Petraglia. He had 11 in a row before finishing with 298. And I asked John, what went through your mind? He says, I went blank. The pressure was so much. Look at Pete shaking. Ten in a row. Ladies and gentlemen, just one more, and that couple, the McCordicks of Houston, Texas, will be $100,000 richer. Pete McCordick, Boeing Immortality. Is that with, a sight, Bo? Within his grasp, one more strike. 1974, Jim Stefanich was the last time. All right, here it is. Right lane. 